I'd like to talk to a, a little bit today about, well, queuing, as the slide says. So uh, a lot of people are a little worried about QoS because it seems awfully technical, and by and large it is. But when you understand it, you understand it, and I think maybe I can help you to understand it. So of all the pieces of um, <clears throat> QoS, uh, today I think we'll talk about queuing and queuing techniques used in Cisco devices. QoS means quality of service. Uh, the long definition is the ability of the network to predictably provide business applications with the service required for those applications to be successfully used on the network. Another way of putting it, and it's far more succinct, but very, very true, is managed unfairness. Because in fact, what we are doing with QoS is to not treat all traffic equally. Why? Because not all traffic is created equally, nor does it all have the same level of preference or requirement for our business requirements, right? Some things in our business are more important so that we can do business than other things. So for example, if there's a particular application that everybody in the company needs to use, that needs to get through and everybody needs access, or at least the people who do. So we would like to uh, be able to prioritize the things which are uh, have the priority of the business model and uh, it works both ways if I'm prioritizing one thing I am one way or another deprioritizing something else so, now of course the reason we do this and the reason we had to start doing this is because not all apps are created equal either in terms of requirements for the enterprise or the way the app itself behaves so that's an issue for us. We have to figure out how we're going to treat the various types of traffic. So uh, data type, type applications are typically we, a company will have created or purchased some type of a data app. And what did they buy, right? Whatever they bought is gonna have to do with what its requirements are. Is it TCP based, whereby it can make up for lost packets and do retransmits? Or is it UDP based, in which case it cannot do that, okay? TCP will guarantee delivery of packets. UDP doesn't do that. Voice and video are both applications that typically use UDP. Well, it makes sense because we really don't want voice or especially voice traffic retransmitted. We want it to go through and get there the first time, but we don't want to retransmit, okay? So whereas uh, for some apps, HTTP, for example, um, TCP would be good, maybe FTP, but not so much for voice or video. The trick is voice's requirements are very stringent so that people can be understood. Things like delay, um, space between packets, uh, these things are uh, have very stringent requirements so that the quality of voice is going to be acceptable to the average user. Video's requirements are a little less probably by humans, even though the requirements on paper are even greater than voice. It requires all the quality requirements, but uses a lot more bandwidth. A voice stream typically has a set bandwidth amount, and they're typically very low by today's standards. But video with high def, etc., can crank up the amount of um, data needed, but they want it to arrive with the same type of quality as voice. Luckily, because we're accustomed to uh, video conferencing not being 100% perfect, uh, you can kind of get by with a little glitch here and there in a video conference. So typically, we tend to treat voice in a corporate environment. It, it requires low bandwidth, but it does typically require the very best treatment. Video, the bandwidth can vary, and we want to give it excellent treatment, but we still typically want to give voice better treatment. After that, the data, um, again, is it TCP, is it UDP? Is it critical to, to the running of the enterprise or is it um, uh, unofficial traffic? So these are the types of things we want the network to be able to tell the difference in. And then we want the network to be able to treat them differently, unfairly, okay? Now, the way we implement uh, QoS in a Cisco environment is by using a thing called the Modular Quality of Service Command Line Interface, 
or the MQC. We do that, first of all, by identifying various types of traffic with a thing called a class map. And a class map, as you can see on the right, will have a name that is a case sensitive name, and then it'll have multiple one or more match statements. Now a class map, um, the statement between class map and the name can say match all or match any. So the trick is if you say match all, traffic that is to be recognized by this class map must match all of the criteria stated. But if you said match any, traffic which it will be recognized by this class map would recognize any one of these. Okay, so whereas match all means and for each statement, match all means or for each statement. There's no point in having a class map unless there is at least one match statement. Okay, you can match on many, many different criteria, access list, layer two marking, layer three marking, interface, uh, protocol, there's a lot of different things that you can match on. And In a policy map, you refer to a class map by case sensitive name and then say how you want that traffic dealt with. So what is the policy I'm enforcing upon the types of traffic? So you see class test refers to the class map from the previous slide. Okay. All right. So with a in a policy map, I can, depending on certain circumstances like uh, the interface I'm applying it to, etc., I can apply marking, queuing, congestion avoidance, shaping, and policing. There are different capabilities to do these things based on the hardware. Not all hardware can do everything 100% identically. But as you'll notice here on the right, there is more than one statement under class test. Now remember, I created it as class map test, but when I'm referred to it in a policy map, I mustn't say class dash map, or I'll leave the policy map configuration and get back into the class map configuration. So you would say class, and it doesn't, class does not have to be capitalized, but the name of the class map is case sensitive. So in this case, they've made a bandwidth statement and a marking statement for the class test type traffic. Now, that has to be applied for it to make any difference at all. All of it is typing practice until you apply it to an interface. And the way you apply it to an interface is using a thing called a service policy. Actually, I shouldn't say a thing. I should say a command called service policy. So in this case, we've applied the service policy from the previous page called demo, case sensitive name, outbound on interface ethernet one slash zero. Okay, so that's how I apply these things you see below. So in order to read what's going on with a policy map or, or with your QoS in a device, you would first look at the interface because if it's not applied on an interface, it's not doing anything at all. And sometimes there will be old class maps and policy maps from years gone by that have long been deinstalled in terms of interfaces. So studying all the lines and only to find out it's not applied anywhere would be a waste of time and effort, right? So the idea is look at interfaces first to see what's actually applied. And then you have to read backwards to see what it's doing. So on this interface, service policy demo out. Okay, that matters. What is policy map demo doing? Oh, for the class test traffic, it's setting bandwidth at 768 and diff serve code point at 15. For class choice two, it's setting bandwidth at 15%. Turn, it's got weighted random early detect turned on and it's shaping. Okay, now if I don't remember what class map test and class map choice two are, then I would look in the configuration at the class map called test and the class map called choice two in order to say on this interface outbound, this is being done to that type of traffic. See, that's how you read it backwards. Now. What I thought we'd focus on a little bit today is queuing, probably one of the most important things in terms of what uh, people implement uh, in the entire uh, QoS realm. Queuing is typically applied as an egress mechanism. There are some machines that can do egress queuing, but some machines can only do, uh, I mean, ingress queuing. Um, most machines in the Cisco world can do egress queuing, but fewer of them can do ingress queuing. 
Um, and the idea is typically, if I'm trying to send information out of an interface, but that interface's small hardware buffer is full, what am I gonna do with that information? What am I gonna do with that packet? Well, I would store it in a queue, right? So uh, the idea typically applied as an egress mechanism, one or more buffer to store excess traffic in times of congestion. So that's critical. If you don't have congestion, then data comes into the device, is sent to the egress interface, goes into the egress queue, and just out it goes as soon as it can. Egress queues uh, in hardware are typically for, handled in a first-in, first-out basis. But if that is full, where do I put it? So I can put it in system buffer, right? I can put it in some buffers on the machine. And then, then I'm able to apply quality of service to that data that's being held in buffer or buffers. I'm able to take data from one buffer more aggressively than another. That's how I get my selectiveness. That's how I treat things unfairly. There's a lot of things in say 20 buffers and I get to select which buffer gets things fed out or buffers get things fed out of them more aggressively than others. That's how I can apply egress QoS in a time of congestion. So we're gonna talk briefly about the following queuing mechanisms, priority queuing, weighted round robin, shaped round robin, weighted fair queuing, class-based weighted fair queuing, and low latency queuing. And we're even gonna talk about round robin in order to make it easier to explain weighted round robin. Now, the earliest queuing mechanism used in Cisco's devices after they, you know, originally they were doing first in, first out. But when they tried to apply a QoS mechanism, the first thing they put in was this thing called priority queuing. Well, the way priority queuing worked was simply to say, look, we have traffic going to these queues. The decision making entity, which we call the scheduler, which uh, uh, deals with this concept of queuing. The scheduler would take packets out of the uh, queues towards the hardware queue one packet at a time. One packet at a time. But in the case of priority queuing, when it's time to put a packet in the hardware queue, it always looks at queue A first. If there was a packet in queue A, it takes it. Then when it's time to take in another packet, it looks at queue A again. If there's a packet there, it takes it. Again, same thing, it will always take a packet out of QA until there is no packet there to take when it's time to take a packet. If it goes to put a packet in the hardware queue and there's nothing in QA, then it goes to QB, okay? That's when it goes to QB. And then it's the next time it is to take a packet, he'll look at QA again. And if there's nothing there, then he'll look at QB again. And if there's something there, he'll take it. And it's time to take another packet. He looks at QA again. And then he looks at QB again. And if there's nothing in QB, then he would move to QC. Okay? So that means he never takes a packet from QD, as in Delta, unless he'd had to take a packet and there was nothing in Qs A, B, or C at all. Now, this served to help prioritize some data. But the problem with it was, if your traffic was trying to go through QD, you might run into the situation where it's being served so seldom, because there's so much traffic in Qs A, B, and C, that you could never get through. And that's what we call protocol starvation, okay? So although priority queuing is better than FIFO, it's not, it's not exactly perfect. Now the next tool we're gonna to talk about is round robin, round robin queuing. Now, as queuing progressed in the routers, they did priority queuing and then they uh, thought of something better than priority queuing called custom queuing. Priority queuing and custom queuing by themselves are essentially extinct, but custom queuing is very much the same concept as round robin queuing, okay? 
Um, custom queuing is actually a little more like weighted round robin, which we're going to talk up, talk about next, but with round robin queuing, the way it worked was, uh, when it's time to take a packet, I just take packets in sequence from each of the queues. So take a packet from QA, then next time take a packet from QB, then QC, then QD, then start again, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. So that meant it treated every Q equally, right? It was purely round robin. So every Q was treated equally. And the only way you could treat one tr type of traffic better than another was to make sure there were uh, more selective sessions in one Q versus another. So on a per second basis, if you had five packets going into QA, and 10 going into QB and um, 15 going into QC and 20 going into QD, if each of those only got serviced approximately five times per second, then QA had all the service he needed. But Qs B, C, and D could not have all the service they needed. You understand? It was very strict, right? And and it, again, it gave no priority, but the way you could implement some prioritization was by putting fewer packets in one queue than another. Uh, for example, in QD, if I had more flows, there would be less treatment per flow than there would in QA. Now, the more advanced style of round robin is weighted round robin, and that's also, as I said, similar to custom queuing. In that case, what you could do is you could say, I will treat one queue more aggressively the next one, the next one, and the next one. Okay, that's the cool thing about weighted round robin, which is very popularly used in the switches, and custom queuing, which is really not used so much anymore. So, as it says here, I could configure it so that QA. Uh, would get four times the service per sec, uh, four four uh, packets sent per second, and QB maybe only gets two, and QC only gets one, and then QD maybe even less frequently than one packet per second. Okay, so in the particular example I've shown here, um, they they're doing weighted round robin queuing and they're what they're saying is if you'll notice the numbers are 52 26 13 and 9 so what it means is that because 52 is twice the value of 26 uh, q1 would be getting twice the service it so it's not necessarily the number of packets it leads to a metric to say I will treat this queue twice as well as I treat this queue and then I'll treat QB twice as well as I treat QC. Now the reason, first of all, how can you put in a router um, a six and a half, right? So the reason that that last number isn't six and a half A is because that's not an option. And B, it's because if you put these all together, if I remember correctly, they equal a hundred. Some switches require for these values to come to a sum total of 100 to account, theoretically speaking, to account for 100% of the bandwidth, okay? And it's just a matter of trying to make it more understandable for the user that they do that because it all, it, it all comes from an algorithm, okay? So what I could do is I could say I have these cues and during the course of a period of time, like a second, this scheduler thing that I was telling you about could be told based on those values uh, over the, the uh, span of time and the, the idea that there are always packets going to the queues, then I could be taking four packets from here, then two packets from here, then one packet from here, and then a little less frequently from there based on what I was showing you. Okay. Now it should be understood that if it's time for the scheduler to take a packet from this queue and there's nothing there, he's not going to wait for a specific period of time uh, to, to, okay, that's his time slot. Queuing never does that in Cisco because that would be something like time division multiplexing that says I've set a time 
period uh, aside for you. We never, ever do that because it would be so counterproductive to say, well, there's a period of time where I could be processing traffic, but I'm not going to because that's somebody else's time slot. We don't do that. If it's time to take a packet from that queue and the scheduler says, okay, well, I've serviced everybody else. I've got to take this. If there's nothing there, He's not going to wait. He will go to the next queue, and if there's a packet, then he'll go ahead and take it. Okay? Both weighted round robin and custom queuing do that. Again, weighted round robin is the typical queuing te uh, technique in switches. Okay? Now, something that Cisco developed, a, a very um, complex and to some degree very cool queuing technique that they developed a long time ago, was called weighted fair queuing. Well, it went back to the previous slide and it said, you know, what are we going to do about making sure that everybody gets serviced? And especially it goes back to priority queuing. We want everybody to get serviced and we want some level of fairness. So the first thing they did was to invent fair queuing. And fair queuing said that, remember how I said you could have lesser traffic in one queue versus another, and that's how you introduced QoS. In fair queuing, every flow gets its own queue within the boundaries of how many queues that the hardware can handle, but there are typically quite a few. And this is a routing technique, not something you would find typically in a switch. But every flow gets its own queue, okay? So there is no concept that uh, the top queue is more important than the bottom queue. There's a different way of introducing priority to a queue, but every flow gets its own queue. Now, what this does is, if there's a particularly verbose flow, he's not sharing his queue with anybody else. So if he has so much data that he overflows his own queue, if I were sharing the queue with him, my data would get dropped as well as his, you see, because there would be no room in the queue to get in. But the nice thing about uh, fair queuing and weighted fair queuing is that everybody gets their own flow. So if somebody's talking faster than he's being dequeued, he's the only one that suffers. Okay. Okay. So weighted fair queuing, uh, in order to in introduce this concept of treating the queues unequally, right? It treats all the queues 100% equally when it's fair queuing, and it would just take them one by one as long as there was a flow. But if I want to treat them unfairly, that's weighted fair queuing. So what weighted fair queuing does is this. It creates a list. And that list, you can think of it as, uh, in Wendell Odom's book, I think he calls it a service number. I like to call it a sequence number. He creates a list, and it's of numerical values, and they have to do with where the packets are. Um, uh, the, the value indicates um, the, the sequence number of a packet and where it is. Okay, that's what the list is going to con uh, contain. So what happens is, as packets come in, they get given a sequence number. And all the scheduler, that little guy I told you off on the right there, uh, does, all he does is to say, um, whoever has the lowest sequence number next, that's the packet I'm going to take next. That's all he does. But how do you get one sequence versus another? Well, what happens is weighted fair queuing does this thing where it's going to uh, um, recognize individual flows. Okay, he recognizes individual flows based on the source IP address, the destination IP address, the source layer 4 port, the destination layer 4 port, the protocol statement in layer three, and also in the IP header, there's a field called the toss byte, the type of service uh, byte, and weighted fair queuing can read the three most significant bits, which historically has identified something called IP precedence. Okay, so put those things all together and hash them. And you come up with a hash value, and that's what uh, a router is going to recognize all flows whose hash value comes out to that same number based upon those six criteria is part of the same flow, okay? So 
During times of congestion, if I can't service a packet for that flow right away, I will put it in a queue. And if there's and if it doesn't already have a queue, I will create a queue. It's called dynamic queuing. I will create a queue for that data. Now, I can prioritize uh, again. Um, there's prioritization. Prioritization is introduced by that IP precedence, because what he's going to do to create that sequence number. He's going to use a mathematical formula, and he's going to look at these three criteria down here. The size of a packet, the time a packet arrived in the queue, and then a um, preference value based upon that IP precedent. It's called a metric. So he's going to like mathematically massage those three factors so that for example, if three packets arrive at the same time, and they can, because the time signature is not the uh, micro millisecond the, the, uh, of when something arrived in the queue. The timer has to do with all packets that arrived in this interface. Uh, um, using the timestamp, the last packet was sent out of this interface completely. Right, so the time signature, the last, um, the, the tail end of the last packet left this interface, is the time signature used until another packet has completely passed out of this interface. So multiple packets could arrive with the time same timestamp. So let's say three packets arrive at the same time, and they're all the same size. If one is IP precedence five and the other one is IP precedence three and the last one is IP precedence zero, the IP precedence five traffic or, or packet will get a much better sequence number than the IP precedence three, which will get a better sequence number than the IP precedence zero. Okay, because the metric value, which is preset by Cisco, you cannot change it. That metric value um, is goes into the calculation and allows the traffic with the better um, value composite to be that which is higher in that list of treatment. Okay, this means that some traffic can take cuts in line. Okay, so it is possible that even if a packet has arrived in the next time um, stamp, its metric might be so much better than something that arrives in this timestamp that it jumps ahead of the sequence value. It jumps ahead in line and is serviced before something that arrived first. Okay, and that's the idea of prioritizing some data versus other data. So again, the size of packet, the time of arrival in the queue, and the preference value. So let's say I have some queues built for individual flows. Okay, so what's going to happen is as the packets arrive in their queues, they're given sequence numbers. And the sequence numbers, I, I must say, are, are relatively large numbers. But I'm going to just um, uh, make this uh, simplistic, okay? So, for example, this might have sequence number one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? All right, so again, these sequence numbers are um, um, arrived at mathematically by a combination of time of arrival, size of packet, and the metric from uh, derived from the IP precedence value, okay? So size of packet, the theory is if I have two flows, one who is sending 1500 byte packets and the other one is sending 500 byte packets, but they're the same IP precedence and they're sending at the same rate, okay? The theory is that it would send three packets of the flow that has 500 bytes per packet for every one of the flow whose packets are 1500 bytes. Fair queuing and, and weighted fair queuing, fair queuing starts out being obsessed with the concept of fairness. And the way we introduce unfairness is with that metric from the IP precedence.
So if two things are the same IP precedents, they would try to he would try very hard to treat them equally. Right. So two things with the same IP precedence, one has 500 byte flows, the other has 1500 byte flows. It'll probably service approximately three to one so that the same amount of throughput goes through for each of those flows. So as you can see from this example, the way they're going to be treated is it'll take packet one, then packet two, then packet three, then packet four, then packet five, then packet six, then seven. Right. So you see who's getting the best treatment? Then eight, then nine, then 10. So still, who's getting the best treatment? We have prioritized these three. And a good example, again, would be that this uh, flow is IP precedence five, this is IP precedence three, and this is IP precedence, say, zero, just for the sake of conversation. So that's what weighted fair queuing can do. Now, there was a problem. The problem with weighted fair queuing is the number of flows. You see, because the more flows there are, the less frequently we get back to this queue, okay? If I had a bunch of other flows, then maybe that they would have value number two down there, right? So um, they, they would be all be getting sequence numbers and the sequence numbers of other flows may be arriving between one and two, right? So it's a little bit like sharing a pie. Um, even if somebody said you get a bigger piece of pie than anybody else, the concept of like I said to you, you get twice as big a piece of pie as anybody else. Here's a pie. You and I are going to share it. So you figure, okay, I get two thirds of that pie until I bring somebody else in, okay? Well, all of a sudden you don't get two thirds, you get half and the other person and myself get a quarter. So you get twice as big a piece as anybody else. Now I bring another piece in, okay? Now the pie is broken into fifths. You get two fifths and each of the other three of us get one fifth. So the, the, the analogy continues. So the moral to the story is weighted fair queuing can prioritize some sessions over others, but it cannot decide on a, a fixed amount of throughput for any individual flow. Because in this case, the more not the merrier, okay? I have to share the bandwidth with more people. So that's the problem with uh, something like weighted fair queuing. The next thing that people um, that they invented at Cisco was a thing called class-based weighted fair queuing. Well, with class-based weighted fair queuing, I can set a metric for how often one type of traffic will be handled versus another. And it doesn't have anything to do with um, the, the uh, type of service or IP precedence or diffs or code point value. I simply identify a type of traffic with a class map. I refer to that class in a policy map. Ooh, see, there's a little typo there. In a policy map, you wouldn't say class map. You would just say class A. So you see here, bandwidth percent 40, bandwidth percent 30, bandwidth percent 20, and bandwidth percent 10. So this is a little bit similar to um, weighted round robin from the standpoint that I can tell the router, treat this queue more aggressively than that one, more aggressively than that one, more aggressively than that one. And yes, this queue, if there's data coming into all four queues constantly or consistently, this queue would get four times better treatment, right? This queue right here would get four times better treatment than that Q, uh, excuse me, twice as good a treatment. And it would get four times better treatment than this Q. So those numbers in class-based weighted fair queuing are relative. They are relative to each other. Now, frequently you don't have to identify 100% um, of the bandwidth in uh, class-based weighted fair queuing. So I could just as easily have said four, three, two, one instead of 40, 30, 20, 10, okay? Because it's still going to come up with a relative metric, okay? It's not actually, I'm gonna serve 40, pack, 40 packets, then 30 packets, then 20, then 10. It's going to come up with a relative 
metric. And it's called class-based weighted fair queuing because it fundamentally uses the weighted fair queuing formula. But instead of um, creating a metric based on IP precedence, it creates a metric based on your bandwidth statement. So in this case, the metric used by class A to go into the formula for creating a sequence number is twice as good as the metric for class C and four times as good as the metric for class D. Finally, the last type of queuing mechanism I'm going to talk about today is called LLQ. LLQ stands for low latency queuing. Okay. Low latency queuing. If you look at this uh, example on the right, all I did to change from the example in the previous page was, and so that's why it still says class map instead of class, is to change this word from uh, this word right here. On the previous page, that word was bandwidth. Now it's priority. The moment you say that in a router and apply it to an interface, of course, you now have LLQ, not CBWFQ. Because what LLQ is, is the idea of adding a priority queue along with a class-based weighted fair queuing configuration. Now, the way this is going to work is similar to what we talked about before. Similar to what we talked about before, the priority queue will always be looked at first. It will always be looked at first. If there's a packet and it's time to put one in the hardware queue, that packet gets taken. Time to take another packet, look at the priority queue first. Time to take another packet, look at the priority queue first. If you look at the priority queue and there's nothing there, you don't look at Q, B, C, or D per se. You look at that sequence list. And remember, packets got put in order in that sequence list based upon the metric of the bandwidth statement in their queue. So, I always take something out of the priority queue if it's if it's there. If it isn't, then I look at that list of packets with their sequence numbers and I take the packet with the best sequence number next. So we have those four queues. Okay, and here's the scheduler. And what is he doing? So we will assume that um, these are the this is the queue with the metric of 40. This is the queue with the metric of uh, 20 and this is a queue with a metric of 10 okay so remember the scheduler isn't even looking at the other queues until until there's nothing in the priority queue okay so he takes this packet then that packet then this packet then that packet have any other packets arrived in the meantime maybe then this packet then this packet now it's time to take another packet and there are no, no new packets in the priority queue. So then again, he's looking at really the, the list of packet sequence numbers and whoever is bubbled up to the top of the list, that's the packet he takes. Is it a packet from the 40 queue or the 20 or the 10? We can't tell based on this, but remember he is going to put the things with the 40 bandwidth statement higher on the list than the things with the 20 or 10, assuming that uh, things like packet size and arrival time are similar. Now, you may say to yourself, wait a minute, when you talked about priority queuing, you talked about the idea of the, the priority queue or the high priority stuff causing the stuff at the bottom to starve. Protocol starvation, you said. Aren't we at risk of protocol starvation? Not in a router. Because if you remember on the pre previous page, remember I said uh, priority 40 or something like that. So in LLQ, what's the point in putting a number there if the scheduler is always taking from there next? The point is this. The number you put when you say priority does not stand for bandwidth. Another uh, element is created automatically in front of that priority queue. And that element is called a policer. And what that policer does is to limit how much data per second may feed into the priority queue. 
So if too much data tries to feed into the priority queue, it will drop the excess data. In that way, it's like the governor on an engine, on, the, on a carburetor. It's a thing that says, LLQ says this treatment, this traffic, or, or, or whatever traffic is in this queue, is going to get, man, it is going to get great, great service. It's going to be what is service next. But if you allow too much to try to go into there, this policer will police everything that breaks the rules. The policer is not cognizant of flows. It just says, I'm only allowing this much traffic to pass per second. And if I've allowed X amount of traffic and you're trying to come next, he doesn't pay attention if you were the first flow created through that queue or the ninth. He doesn't know and he doesn't care. He will drop your packet because it's breaking the rules. So whereas LLQ is there to guarantee that a particular type of traffic is sent out of the queues very, very aggressively, it could also be very dangerous in terms of it will drop traffic that breaks the rules. So creating LLQ forces you to also make sure you limit rather carefully how much traffic is going to be feeding into that queue. So here's my example of LLQ. You see, people think um, in terms of these values, they have a tendency, you know, it's true that the 30, the 20, and the 10 are all relative to each other. But that six isn't relative to anybody. That six defines that policer. So we've said um, only 6% of the stated bandwidth on the interface I apply this to is allowed to feed through that policer. And again, that's how we're protecting the queues for um, class B and C and D so that there's plenty of bandwidth available for them to be serviced. And then you see I've put the service policy called demo outbound on the interface. Okay, so that's my discussion of queuing. As I've said, classification is, is typically used, uh, implemented, programmed to teach a device to recognize one type of traffic versus another. Marking is what we use to um, mark traffic. These are just QoS tools. Marking is what we use to mark traffic so it's easier to classify as it passes through the network. Congestion management is queuing and that's what we talked about today, okay? The command construct for implementing QoS is called the MQC or modular QoS command line interface. We use class maps to identify one or more types of traffic, a policy map, to identify how we're going to treatment and a service policy to apply those settings to one or more interfaces.